thank you all so much for being here and for sharing your work with HFF. Um, yeah, I love all of these films and I feel very blessed to have you all be a part of this. Um, so as like, you know, a lot of you might know, HFF was started in St. Vincent and the Grenadines um, a couple of years ago. And um, that's where I grew up and Zuri, you also grew up there, right? Well, as a teenager, yes. As a teenager, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, we just, we started the festival to kind of support the filmmaking industry in, in St. Vincent, you know, which, oops, one second. <laughs> Sorry about that little technical mishap. We're in these, um, our sponsor has these offices and um, it, it's very nice to have a space and there's nobody here obviously because no one's working because of COVID and stuff. So it's really nice and empty and there's coffee and stuff, which is useful because it's midnight. But, um, but there's all this strange technology that just makes noises and does things on its own. So we're uh, just getting the hang of it, sorry. <laughs> um, so this evening, we're just probably just gonna go through like probably from in the order of the films that, as they were shown and um, yeah, just chat a little bit about it and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, Beth will send me the questions that if we get from the audience. Um, so we're gonna start with you, Zuri. It's so nice to see your face. It's actually yeah. really lovely because um, I taught the, um, a film course, well, the first film course in St. Vincent and, um, uh, you know, Zuri was like someone who, who really um, kind of like, Zuri like took all of this sort of initiative and like we, we just started working together and I, I helped her out with her project, which was so good actually. You made a, tell us a little bit about that project actually. Yeah, so the very first short film I did was for a project for school. It was for my final, like a graduating class project. And it, um, filmmaking was something that I, I guess that was what started my interest in filmmaking. And it was really fun. I got was a lot of help with that. And it was kind of combining um, documentary style, like interviews and um, uh, narrative, like fictional style, um, like acted out scenes, which I'm an actress, so I really enjoyed that too. And it was really to um, kind of educate people about art because NSVD art is kind of a looked down upon profession. Um, hopefully that changes, but at the time it was um, something that uh, was not really valued a lot. Um, so that was what that short film was about. And yeah, that's what kind of kicked off my interest in filmmaking, so. Yeah, it's such an important uh, subject because people in Simmons and there's kind of this conception that art isn't, um, that it's, first of all, it's easy, right? Like, oh yeah, you know, if you don't want to do work, you take the art course, which is just, you know, it's like, <laughs> I mean, Eves, you, you, you're aware of how much goes into uh, of course. a painting you know so um it's something that a lot of the people who come through the art program really kind of try to push back against it's like no this is like incredibly hard work and it's important it's like artists are important to a society you know Indeed. More, more than important they're crucial um so Zuri's film first film was about that which was such an accomplishment um but this film so I like when I saw it I was so pleased that you had chosen to like represent what was going on you know obviously this like huge uh huge you know election that was just sort of unprecedented in how polarized the country was and um and you know it's got this music that is so somber and, and like you know and, and at one point there's a um one of the signs says voting is a thrill and the music is just like, you know, like, wow, there's nothing thrilling about what's going on here. Um, so tell us a little bit about why you felt, why you wanted to talk about this moment. Well, I 
the college that I'm going to was supposed to have, well, they did have a walk to, this event called Walk to the Poles, where um, people, normally what they do is they have like vans and all the students would go um, into the town and go to the polls and vote. But because of COVID, they can't really do that. So what they did was more of like a walk thing where people would walk in groups and go. And I was hoping to be able to do that um, with a group, but that doesn't work out. And so I thought that I could just kind of drive around and kind of capture what was going on. Because um, I, I thought that it was an important moment to capture. Uh, like you said, it was a pretty, you know, interesting and eventful and anxiety provoking on whatever side you're looking at it from. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it was, I made the film in a, a day because I wanted to get it up the same day. So it was hectic, but it was really fun. and. <laughs> It's uh like that you mentioned, like the sign says voting is a thrill, but the music was not, you know, <laughs> but uh, I, I think that um, it was interesting to uh, kind of be on like, a, from a filmmaking perspective versus like just living out the day, because when you're just kind of going about your day, you know, you vote and then you do whatever else you have to do. And um, in some cases, like I think classes were held that day, but you know, kind of your mind can be focused on other things at that point. So I guess it's interesting because I was trying to focus on like what the story was, you know, what did I want it to be about like other than, you know, capturing voting, like what's like the emotion behind it. So it was interesting to kind of not just like be in the moment, but also like think of how can I translate this into something that's interesting. Absolutely. So what are you studying right now? Is it film related? I'm studying performing arts. Okay. So just kind of continuing on with what I was studying previously, yeah. which was fine art. This is performing arts. So similar. Yeah. yeah. Do you do you see yourself like making more films in the future or going more into like acting stuff or combination? Yeah, definitely. Um, that's what I hope to do with the rest of my life. And um, you know, this is just a start. This is only the second one I've made, but hopefully I can continue to make more. I think you have a really strong eye. And you know, the first film that Zuri made, it was half an hour longer. Mm -hmm. It was like 45 minutes long, I think. Yeah. And I think, you know, like as filmmakers, we know how hard it is sometimes just to make five minutes, you know, so it was really, uh, really impressive. And I think you really have a knack for this, you know, so I'm so I'm so happy to hear that you're like, continuing with it. And, you know, the festival is always here to support your work and, you know, everything that you have going on. Thank you, thanks so much. For sure, do you have any ideas right now of stuff you wanna work on? Um, uh, <laughs> my brain is full of like schoolwork and stuff at the moment, but I am thinking of things. So nothing at the moment, but I'm just kind of waiting to see what my brain comes up with and what I'm inspired by. So hopefully something arises in the future. Yeah. I'm sure it will, I'm sure it will. Okay, Zuri, thank you. Thank you. Um, next up, Eves, and we don't have Stephanie with us. She did Live Edge. I don't know if you guys got to see the films, but she's not with her today, but it's a lovely film with us today. Um, so Eves and Lydia, thank you guys for being here. It's a tremendous um, honor to be here. Thank you. Thanks, Aiko. Um, this film is like just so special. Um, and I mean, where do I even begin with it? Like it's, it's uh, very, very powerful. And um, I think, you know, there, there was just so much in it that, 
that I just thought was so magical. And, you know, maybe maybe a good place to start is how you guys met and how this collaboration came about. Yeah. Um, well, I'll, I'll answer like half and Eve, you can fill in. <laughs> you so can supplement me. anything that I'm forgetting. But now it's um, been almost three years ago that we met in February of 2018. We actually met on the New York City subway. Uh, we sat next to each other. Um, and uh, there, a big part of that interaction was Eve's daughter, Sarai, who was uh, very adorable and sort of <laughs> brought us together and talking. And um, But we quickly sort of discovered this shared background and interest in um in music and specifically violin playing and i think the way in which um it's possible to you know keep music integrated in your life as an adult when it's not your career and so we sort of were both interested in that question um and you know it wasn't until sort of the end of the subway ride that i figured out that violin was only one component of Eve's life and um, there was so much more. And, um, you know, we, we sort of kept talking about the right way that um, we could work together and create this portrait of his life that would somehow show that all of those things were possible at the same, in, in the same life. And so, um, yeah, Eve, if I missed anything, feel, feel free to chime in. <laughs> No, you, everything is on point. Everything you said is perfectly fine. Yeah, it's that's so exactly how it happened. I think that you did such a good job of like unfolding this. You know, Eve's um, your you know your character that comes through in the film. It's just uh, such a incredibly unique human being, and um, you know, I think like real testament to the power that human beings have to be so. Uh, individual unique and self-determining um, and I wanted to ask you as well you know because you're you're playing your music and you're speaking all these languages and you're being this amazing father and you're raising money to send back home and and you're and and I think Lydia also your filmmaking style like the sort of observational style really um, was such was such a great choice for this because it just unfolds so naturally. There's just like this organic uh, naturalness, you know. To to nothing feels forced about it, you know. Um, but Eves, I wanted to ask you, like, you know, when did you start playing the piano, and when did you, like, what was the point at which you were like, you know, what I'm just gonna play at work? Well, technically, I stopped playing the violin. Um... January 22nd, 1990. Oh, That's when, it's okay. That's when I took my <laughs> first lesson. I also played the piano as well, but I don't talk about it. Uh, I took my first lesson in January 22nd, 1990. I was working at Pizza Hut as a manager. And that's when the passion started. And I never put it down. I kept practicing. And I, around that time, I was pretty much 22 years old. And I kept practicing and practicing. Certainly, there were there were a lot of discouragement. People say, "Oh, you're too old. You should have started earlier." You know, things of a sort. But I never gave up. I just keep on playing, keep on playing, keep on practicing, keep on going to the Bronx every Sunday morning religiously, taking private lessons from David Burnett, my teacher, whom I love very much. So this is how technically I un, uh, developed, and this is how I got to. To the point where I'm at right now, playing great composers like Johann Sebastian Bach, Mozart, Mendelssohn, Brahms, you name it. And it's just like a more than a hobby. It's, it's everything that I could ever dream of since I was a child. And I'm so grateful that Lydia was able to inculcate this part of my life within the film because um, it, it's like it's not something that I ever expected to happen. So it was like a dream come true. That's beautiful. Thank you. Um, when did you leave Haiti and move to the States? I, I came to New York on September 28th, 1985. I was only 17 years old. I came as a tourist, you know, and I love the country because most of my friends were living here. So I decided to go to school. And I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a land of opportunity. 
and I'm not lazy, so therefore I made things possible. I would have worked my way up high school, college, you know, trade schools, you know, yeah. this is a lot of things just to make it happen. I mean, what keeps you going? Because, you know, like you were saying you would have all of those uh, negative comments and people mm-hmm. saying, oh, you can't do this or you're too old for that. Well, normally I like challenges. I love challenges. And I love Lydia for that sense, because when we said we were going to Haiti, the time we decided to go to Haiti, it was a very tough period. I'll discuss that later. To answer it to your question, what keeps me going is the fact that normally people always tend to underestimate you, especially if you don't have certain privileges, if you don't have certain opportunities. So what I do, anything that I do in this world, it's always based on a lot of hard work. You know, like I mentioned to McIntosh in the New Yorker, to graduate high school, I went to day school, night school, summer school, day school, night school, summer school, you know, to graduate high school. I mean, what motivates me is the fact that I don't always have everything that I need to succeed, but I forge two irons to, to the fire. I do anything to make it happen. And this is technically part of my nature, you know, coming from Haiti after all, you know, there is no other way to do it, but that way, yeah. make it happen, make it happen. Well, it's truly inspirational, seriously. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much. I, when, when I heard that you would be joining us, I was so thrilled. Um, I was like, oh, I get to speak to this amazing person. I'm flattered. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, um, and, and like in terms of, um, you know, when you're working, like was there a point that you decided to start playing in the lobby? Was, you know, was anyone like, it's noisy or, you know, well, what happened is my shift start very early. I start at 6.30 in the morning. So pretty much at 6.30, no one is around. Mm-hmm. So I make the best of it by practicing from 6.30 to 7.30. Although it's noisy, but it's a beautiful noise. And I can oh, assure no, you of that. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Because it's, it's beautiful music. No, that I just meant were people complaining about. No, in fact, people support that greatly. And people are always amazed. That's what amazed That's me the most. Yeah. People walked in and they see you playing the violin. And just like, oh, my God, I can't believe this. Yeah. And normally I would say, oh, this is New York. Anything is possible. You know, but people are highly appreciate the fact that they can walk into a lobby here in New York, you know, and see someone playing, um, playing the violin. And fortunately, my superiors at work, they don't have an issue against that. They love it. In fact, the fact that they are concierge can play the violin, you know, so. mm -hmm. It's like a gift, you know, you wake up to that and come down. and, And it also seemed like a point for you to connect. Like there's that guy in the beginning, you're showing him the music you know that's dr q that's dr q he's a great cellist and an amazing psychologist mm-hmm. um he or he even coached me on certain things while he's passing through so he just to show you that's the beauty of what i do imagine the guy is a great pianist great cellist and a psychologist passing through the lobby just on his way home and he would ask me what are you working on and then he would take a peep and lydia did such a marvelous job with the film it's so natural. It just flawless. It just like there, nothing was staged. There was nothing staged in that entire, entire documentary. And I can't thank her enough for her great eyes. You know, she just very talented in her own ways. And I'm so grateful to her for the fact that she discovered me. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure I'm not the only person in New York who has such talent, who capable of doing so many things. However, to be discovered by someone like Lady and to be put out there for people to see you, to be able to win best documentary in Barcelona, Spain, to have your film presented among the best film that our festivals around the world, the Hamptons, you know, it, 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 Brooklyn Academy of Music. It, it's a fantastic thing. It's a wonderful thing. And I think that there's a really powerful message in there, you know, when you go back to Haiti and Mm-hmm. You're talking about and it made me think about why we started this festival in the first place mm-hmm. or sort of reclaiming narrative and when you're when you're having the conversation with the painter and you know it's like it's so beautiful and you're like this is what Haiti is like and and people are like yeah and he's like you know I don't I don't some people like to just portray it as like the ripped clothes and the you know those kinds of poverty scenes and 
the importance of reclaiming that narrative as people from the region and sort of being like, no, no, like we, we you know, we have a right not to be defined by the, the, the most the struggling aspects. Like there's all this beauty, there's this power, there's this talent, there's this potential, you know? And I thought that that was such a, a powerful uh, moment in the film. And um, you're, um, where did the idea come from for you to start selling paintings in order to raise money for the school? Right after the earthquake. In fact, this is the second school that I'm, I'm working on. The one that you saw in the film, the first school it was is complete and it's running perfectly. And I thank God for that. The idea came right after the earthquake. Um, I went down there, it was chaotic, it was a mess. People were dying left to right. The situation was unbearable. So at the building where I work, a lot of people contributed a lot of money to me, personal money, because I was victim also of the earthquake. My mother's home was technically collapsed like a deck of cards. And also five people from the young generation passed away from this aftermath. So I decided to take that money, not to invest it in my immediate family, but to donate it to others who have no family that can really support or do anything for their community. So I went south, I went to Leo again with that money. And then I had some major donors who supported me and keep funding. And I used the art as a special medium to sell to raise funds and to support that great endeavors. Otherwise, it would not have been possible because I had to have something to have money, to create money. And there was so much things going on in New York with Haiti, with the earthquake. It was not possible to keep asking people to write checks. So I had to, some, I had to have something to offer. So the paintings was technically, were technically the main medium that I could use at that time, still to this day, to offer to someone, say, listen, if you buy this painting, we will be able to run the school for at least two months, three months. We'll be able to buy school supplies. And then with this, all these efforts, other people join in and make it possible. And that's how I start selling the paintings um, to raise funds. Well, I love it because it's not just, um, it's, there's a really nice kind of, conversation happening there you know you're getting this piece of art that's from the island and then mm -hmm. that money is going back into you know helping people there so that's you know that's really wonderful thank you um, are you still um you're still selling the paintings now or does, does that does still that do help? Does i still do i still do raising? oh the film helps tremendously the film helps tremendously it puts me out there um, certainly COVID technically put a stamp on us because of the situation with COVID, things tend to slow down. There is no art show, there is no exhibitions. So it's yeah. very hard to go forward with the project as far as setting arts. But yeah. we are patient, we are waiting, we are out there. They know who we are, they know where we stand, they know what we are doing. So I'm pretty sure in the near future, people will step forward and will volunteer to help out because whosoever that wish to go to Haiti and do something in the communities where I'm helping, they are more than welcome to join me in any trips, anytime. I'm extremely flexible. Amazing. That's how I operate. Yes. Thank you. Fantastic. How are your Thank daughters? You. She, um, they are amazing. They are amazing. They are growing. They're at your school. Everybody's at home. That's how it works. They're so, they're so lovely. So, thank you thank you very much i think like you know the conversations that you have with them about you know and the one about michael jackson as well <laughs> you know um and to, to to ask lydia i mean how long were you guys working on this how much material did you shoot what was the process like yeah we i think we started working together in um uh september of 2018 and then um um, she, I think shot through sort of spring into the next year and so we really based it around these you know there's like a general outline for the film in terms of these are the areas of Eve's life that um, we want to sort of find a way of documenting but we weren't really sure how or what it would look like and so then I think the specificity of those moments are were just sort of you know 
<laughs> what what happened when the camera was was rolling um but like there were sort of you know we knew we wanted to go to Haiti we knew we wanted to film at the office we wanted to film at home and so we, we sort of devised this you know, this, this plan together of, of different places and environments to capture observationally. And, um, you know, that, that sort of covered those maybe six months or so. That's lovely. It sounds like it was really collaborative. And um... yeah, I mean, I think it was, you know, we had the shared connection of, of music, but there was a lot of things that um, Eve was really the expert on and I really just wanted him to guide me in terms of what we were filming and um, certainly the the trip to Haiti also was sort of a chance for you know <laughs> like me to just take a total backseat and just follow Eve around and 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 film whatever happened and um, really sort of let him direct that part of the film and so um, it was a great sort of uh, chance for us to each share those that role absolutely i'm so sorry i've been pronouncing your name eves it's time. okay I'm so that's sorry. fine that's fine that's fine <laughs> my mistake um yeah i mean it's just lovely and there's been such an amazing response to it right it's done so well thank you yeah i mean lady is extremely talented that's <laughs> no doubt about it eve always hands me or talks me up but um it has been really you know we, we were lucky to have a cup have quite a couple um you know in-person screenings and then sort of switched over to the virtual format you know for yeah. for other festivals but um you know what's what's great about virtual although we also did this in person is that we can do a lot of these q a's together and yeah. um it's sort of you know easy to facilitate that with with uh with zoom so yeah exactly and i mean in some senses if all of this hadn't happened then you know we might not be connecting in these ways you know so there's a lot of there's always um some kind of um growth that i think can come out of um pretty hard times and, and struggle um what are you working on anything next lydia i'm starting to um put some very like <laughs> very vague ideas together for sort of a longer form project that's sort of about about music I have to tell Eve about it it's new <laughs> it's <laughs> okay new as of <laughs> um so that's that's sort of the plan right now but um you know just just really taking time in no rush to start the whole process again process, because yeah. you know it's it's been such a year that I think it's like these things can should take the time that they take. Yeah, definitely. I think as a creative person as well, it, sometimes it's hard to just churn out. It's not necessarily like a button you can press and then you, I mean, everyone's different, you know? Um, I find for myself like creating, it can be very linked to a lot of other things in my life, you know? Yeah, um, totally so, the same way. What's that? Oh, just feel the same way. <laughs> <Totally>. <laughs> yeah yeah um well you know it's just such a blessing to have you guys here and um yeah i can't wait to see the next work and definitely i'm gonna um keep in touch and and follow keep following both of you guys thank you yeah, thank you um just to let the audience know they can send in any questions if they want and we'll take them in a little bit we're going to chat with layla um next Layla thank you so much for being here I think you're muted sorry Aiko I just wanted to say thank you to you and to Beth for having us and for showing Lifted of course it's an incredible film it's so beautiful um and Layla you are the you work at the UNHCR Yes, I work for UNHCR, that's a refugee agency of the UN. And um, so I am based in Trinidad and Tobago mm -hmm. and lifted it, we made lifted with the help of a very talented director, Miguel Galofre, yeah. in order to speak a little about the challenges that 
some of the Venezuelans coming into Trinidad are facing and also to talk about, to, to try to demonstrate that people have a lot more in common than they have differences and trying to talk about, um, you know, things that they have in common. So when you see the children in the end talking and asking about where are you from and this is where I am from and sharing um, a, a, a common experience, yeah, you know. Yeah, it's very moving. It's, I was very moved um, the first time I watched this film when we were screening the submissions and I was like, this, this, we have to show this, you know, because also as somebody, you know, my, my um, grandfather was born in Trinidad, born in Port of Spain, and um, he came to the UK in the Windrush uh, generation. And um, I always feel at home in Trinidad and I have some really close friends and like mm -hmm. family. And when I was one, um, you know, we lived there for two years and, um, and um, you know, it's, it's always a place that I feel like a certain kind of uh, intangible connection with. And so I was aware of um, things like the Venezuelan migration there and aware that it was this sort of social issue that was quite con controversial in a lot of ways. And when I saw this film, um, I thought that it, it articulated all of these things in such a tender, um, a human way. And, um, you know, you really see what, what they're struggling with, the extent of the stigma and all of these things. And um, I wanted to ask, like, maybe you can tell us, tell the audience a little bit about what is fueling all of this migration. Well, unfortunately, the situation in Venezuela these days is difficult. And there has been a lot of insecurity. So that there are more than 5 million Venezuelans who have left their country, some of whom have gone in towards the Caribbean. Uh, so we have Venezuelans in Trinidad, but there are also on other islands as well. For example, Aruba, Curaçao, or the Dominican Republic. Um, in um, Trinidad, we have approximately 86% of our refugees and asylum seekers, we have around 20,000, are from uh, Venezuela. Uh, and in many ways, Trinidad is a truly amazing place. There is so much diversity and individual Trinis are really very, very welcoming. But it is also a challenge. Uh, people I never knew until I got here that uh, Trinidad and Venezuela were only about eight miles apart, which I mean, is really something yeah, to well, realize that they are so close. Yeah. And I think that sometimes, um, you know, people get scared about the situation. You know, they worry about how it will impact on their country. But hopefully, as the movie demonstrates, we have a lot more in common than we have different. Absolutely. And um, I was there last year for Trini Carnival, actually. And, you know, one of the things that I noticed on that trip particularly were the, you know, the birds that you, you like, they're these incredible birds that you just don't have in St. Vincent, where I grew up. Um, and that's because it's so close to South, South America that they come over, you know, so you'll just see this incredible bird with this red, huge red feathers just sitting on the mm -hmm. like just in the middle of Port of Spain sitting on on a wire you know and it's um really amazing um to, but to talk a little bit about the you know these similarities as well you know the film you have all of the people who work at Alice Yard um teaching the Moko Jumbies you know there's that conversation that they all have which is really yes. striking because they talk about when they realize what race they were you know, and that's such an interesting thing because it really highlights the fact that like race is socially constructed, like it's a real thing, but there's a social projection, right? Because you don't innately, you're not born and you're like, oh yeah, I'm black or I'm white or I'm mixed or I'm Chinese. You know, you realize it at some point that mm -hmm. somebody, that, that your life experience is informed by the body that you were born into. And that means these things. And also, you know, like in terms of the parallel with the Venezuelan family and what they're experiencing, um, they're experiencing a very otherizing situation, like being, you know, forced out of their homeland that, that Carlos talks about. 
with such love. And he's an incredible young man as well. Um, and he, he is. He's grown quite taller. I yeah, can't tell I can you imagine. that. It's the best time I saw him. I can imagine. Um, and why is there so much stigma, do you think? I think that it, some of it comes from, from, from fear, afraid that uh, having persons coming in will potentially uh, lead to destabilization or would potentially uh, change things. Mm. Um, it's uh, a lot of also uh, when you speak with people, they talk about the fact that Trinidad is a very small place. You know, it's a small island, two small islands, and Venezuela is such a large country. But I, as I said, I, I sometimes think that from my perspective, there's a lot more in common. And it always amazes me that Trinidad is such a wonderfully diverse country with so, with persons coming from all over. And it has such wonderful lessons that it can teach everyone. Uh, being, uh, having people coming from so many different places and also having the indigenous Warao community and all people living together, um, that there is a lot more to offer. And I hope when we made the movie, it was very much that we were hoping that it would be able to spark this conversation in Trinidad to make people aware of what they what there is in common as opposed that there is different. Unfortunately, in the in the time since, because of COVID, um, the borders of the country have closed. And so if anything, I would say um, some of the, because of the pandemic and the fear, the government has taken steps to protect the people, but at the same time, sometimes that fear has grown uh, because it has now been interlinked with the pandemic. Of course, of course, yeah. Yeah, it's like this additional layer of, of fear that, that comes on it. Um, how long have you been there? For I've been there for two and a half years. Yeah, how do you, yeah. how do you like it? Well, as I said, Trinidad is a pretty special place. Yeah. So I feel very lucky to, to be here. Yeah, Did you, do you remember the time you first ate doubles? Uh, I definitely remember the first time I ate doubles. I am uh, actually doubles is some of my favorite Trini foods. It's so good. Yes. And, uh, you know, just you, you see the diversity in Trinidad in so many different ways, double being a really good example, you know, when you look at the cooking or then you look at the carnival or the Christmas traditions and you can see how the experiences of persons coming from so many different places have impacted and changed and, and created what the experiences that people are having now in, yeah. uh, in, in Trinidad and sort of they've absorbed it and made it part of their own culture. Okay. So I am hoping that the Venezuelans will not be seen always in a negative light, but will be seen as, wonder, as being able to add so much more yeah. to Trinidad to make it even a better place and absorbing even more ideas from different communities to grow in absolutely new directions. I think that that message has really far reaching implications as migration is something that affects the whole world, you know, and is, is an issue everywhere um, and a controversial topic everywhere. So I think that this film is really, it's so powerful. So thank you so much for that. No, thank you. Um, we've got a couple of questions, comments um, from Jamali, Jack, um, Eve, or even variation um, says the way in which Lydia hid the camera in a lot of the shots of even variations is brilliant. Via Strawn also agrees that um, Jamali noting the natural and flawless storytelling that makes you feel as though you're really in the space, watching it in real time. So observational style, so powerful. Thank you. Um, Via Strawn wants to ask Zuri a question. 
Are you interested in making more documentaries in the future? Are there any documentary filmmakers that you're particularly inspired by? Um, I wouldn't mind making documentaries in the future. I will admit that I'm more interested in like making like fictional characters, like narratives style things but i i don't i don't think i think if something comes up where i feel like this would make a good like story like a documentary then i would i, I don't think i would limit myself um in terms of my favorite like documentaries um i would say that the most the documentaries that i watch are like true crime things um I can't think of like an exact um, one off the top of my head, but I, I watch true crime documentaries. So, yeah. <laughs> um, I remember you expressing your passion for like narrative and fiction films from before. And I think, you know, I mean, working in film, it's it requires, I think, so much of yourself. And so like, it's one of those things, like when you see someone's made a film about something, you're like, right, this person really cares about this thing because they're willing to go through what it takes to um, make, make this come to life, you know? So I really like, I really support you on your journey on pursuing Thanks. that. Thank you. <laughs> um, Jimon Bergen wants to ask a general question to all the participants. Are there any Caribbean centric issues or just lesser known aspects of Caribbean life and culture you wish to plan, you wish or plan to cover in the future? To elaborate specifically to the filmmaker's country, though not exclusive to their own. So are there any, yeah, like hidden things in the Caribbean that you think would make good sorts of topics for films? What do you think, Eve? Well, the livelihood in the Caribbean itself is a form of art. There are so many segments, I believe, if Lydia, Lydia had the time, she could have just dissected even variation and certain aspect would just be a film in itself. The life in the village uh, um, of that seashore where I have the school, there, there could be a documentary in itself. Um, the Harlem Fine Art Exhibition area right there is a film in itself. Um, since we, like the passage through Port-au-Prince, which you did not see, from Port-au-Prince to Jacques Mel, that scenery, there were a lot of things going on. You know, that could have been another um, film or documentary because we went to a clinic, there was a little emergency on the road with one of the filmmaker, you know, with one of the camera lady, you know, the videographer, mm -hmm. the videographer, she had a little health situation. We went to a clinic. I mean, that in itself could also be a documentary. So I believe there's so much that the Caribbean has to offer only if you step foot in there you can discover it. Yeah. That's that's my personal point of view of that question. Yeah. Yeah. That's part of why we wanted to do the festival as well, right? To to have to like carve out more spaces that are to celebrate our stories and 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 be like, you know, even in some senses like, no, we're not just, you know, white sand beaches or even like poverty stricken places, you know. Correct. There's Correct. so much more to what we are. Everyone's not just sitting on the beach smoking and drinking rum you know and like you know a lot of people think and that is also the image of certain places that has been exported you know because tourism is an important um industry and correct um, and i know that it's brought so much revenue but i think like what gets lost is a lot of character and a lot of soul so definitely i, I totally agree with you there um, and Lydia, you. had you spent much time in the Caribbean before you went to Haiti? Yeah, I mean, no, because my entry point for this was really, you know, through Eve. And so in some yeah. ways I was, um, you know, learning uh, as much that, that like through Eve and through sort of the experience of 
making the film. Um, but I would say, you know, I think what is like, so what I was really interested in, you know, besides just Eve as a person to portray was sort of this value that art can have, you know, both as representing a place, but also as this sort of commodity that can be this, um, you know, system of exchange for bringing revenue to a place, you know, through a sort of like dialogue between countries. And I, it was really sort of fascinating to, through Eve's work, really think about you know, what can art do? What can art be? And how can it really be part of this, um, this exchange, this dialogue between, you know, two, two countries, between someone's home country and, and their host country. And um, I think that phenomenon was, was really fascinating to me and something I could see myself pursuing in the future. Yeah. It's a beautiful thing how each project kind of, um takes you somewhere maybe physically or just psycho-emotionally that you wouldn't have gone otherwise you know and that's one thing I love about when I work on various things is like you know I'm constantly learning about the world about myself and every project sort of has a has an impact and opens opens things up um, about the world which is so beautiful and then you know just being here with you guys is just such a such a privilege um, we've got one more question or comment, I think. Jamon Bergen wanted to say that he appreciates Lifted, um, especially touching on the aspects of racism and xenophobia in Trinidad uh, and Tobago. And some forget that Venezuela and Trinidad have a shared history. That's interesting. I don't know too much about that, um, that history. <laughs> only being eight miles apart there's obviously a lot of shared history between right. them and I cannot tell you how many Trini and uh, Trini Trinbagonians I have met who've told me that they have family back in Venezuela yeah. of course because you can literally just stand on the south and see Venezuela right and you can see it on the other side yeah, yeah. wow mm -hmm. it's so interesting when you think like thinking about borders and migration and like you know, that land over there, it's so different in all these ways, but it's just there, you know, yeah. like um, that might sound really self-evident, but, you know, it's, it's just thinking about the way that we've structured, the human beings have structured the world, and, you know, these borders and what that exactly. means. Exactly. When we're all, like you say, we all have so much more in common than we, than we might think. You know? it, 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 they do, and I until I, I got here, I really did not, I have to admit, a certain amount of ignorance about the history of the region or the fact that places were so close together. So for me, it has been a real eye-opening experience to try to understand a little more about this part of the world. Do you think you'll, you'll, you'll um, be there for, for much longer in Trinidad? Or? Actually, my assignment here will be ending pretty soon, but unfortunately, I think that our office will still be here for a while mm -hmm. uh, because there is a situation in Venezuela that is going through a very difficult time right now. And so there is uh, not only in Trinidad, but in much of Central and South America, uh, countries that are responding to assist Venezuelans who are um, who have been forced to leave their country. Well, thank you for your work there. No, oh, thank you for having us and for giving us an opportunity to let people know a little about some of the people we're trying to help. Of course, of course. Um, and I don't think we have any more questions. Oh wait, oh yes we do. Um, question to all the filmmakers from Jamali. He says that he pays a lot of attention to titles as they are sometimes the first identifying characteristic of a film. What was your thought process in deciding your film title? Okay. Um, I think for at least for Lifted, a lot of it had to do with the fact that one, it was highlighting the Mocha Jumbi experience that the children are going through as they are learning to walk. And then at the same time that it is lifting you beyond the current experiences that you are 
facing at this time. Beautiful. Anyone else? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, the title for even variation is really hard. I knew <laughs> that I wanted it to be related to um, a musical term. And um, so there's this musical idea of theme and variation where the theme of a musical piece is repeated over and over again, but with a slightly different um, interpretation each time. And that to me felt like this, um, it felt representative of sort of the cyclical nature of Eve's lifestyle and sort of the way that um, he re repeats these, you know, this sort of exchange and trips back and forth between New York and Haiti. And um, yeah, it was sort of like a last minute um, combination of, of Eve's name. It's a portrait about Eve, but also sort of in combination with this musical term, so. Oh uh, yeah, for me, I had also I had like a list of potential titles because I really wasn't sure what I wanted to name it. But I, I, uh, my mom also helped me like brainstorm ideas, um, and we felt like while we wait would be a good name because I mean it's capturing kind of the experience of waiting for something to happen because. Either way, things are going to change and you never know. You never know what's going to happen in an election or in any type of situation where it's not really, you, you can't really control it. So, yeah. and yeah, it was meant to be atmospheric. So. Yeah, there's something about those in-between spaces, you know, like, I've always found that kind of interesting. Like you're not there, you're not there, you're somewhere in between. Like, and I know, for example, like a lot of Japanese um, art and design like thinks about negative space as um, almost as its own space that has its own quality and its own character. And that's kind of interesting, like thinking about, yeah, the quality of like waiting and not knowing, um, dealing with uncertainty in life, which is, you know, a huge, a huge part of life. Um, amazing. Well, if anyone else has anything to add um, before we wrap up, anything I didn't ask that might have been, you know, important about the work. I don't think so, but thank you so much for having us and yeah, for it's letting a Tremendous us honor, thank you. Thank you and good luck with the festival. Thank you so much. And um, uh, it's been such a pleasure talking to all of you and um, take care. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone.